welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to The Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on The Jet Setter Show. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It's my pleasure to welcome Michael Margrave to the show. He is an attorney in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I had him on my Holistic Survival show previously talking about gun trust, and I found out that he has a very interesting hobby, a very unique form of travel, and that is ownership of your own rail car. The romance and nostalgia of railroads is pretty interesting to myself and and a lot of other people. And today we're going to talk to him about owning your own rail car and what it's all about. Pretty interesting. Michael, welcome. How are you? I'm doing very well, Jason. Good to talk to you again. Well, likewise. So, First of all, how did you become interested in owning your own rail car? Well, it's, uh, I always liked the trains as a, a kid growing up and kind of a latent interest for many years. And oh, probably in the early 90s, I came across this group that I'm now a member of that uh, members restore and operate these uh, old railroad cars anywhere from uh, 100 years old up, uh, down to maybe 50-something so probably about 1998, I uh, struck a deal with one of the railroads. They had uh, some excess cars, and I acquired my car back then, and it took me four years to get it up to speed. And so about 2002, I uh, took the uh, first trip in my car called Promontory Point. <laughs> That's great. Great name. So what did you do? Hook it on to an Amtrak train? Well, here's once you get it uh, ready to go, there's two ways to uh, travel with these cars. One is, uh, you're absolutely correct, uh, probably the most common is to hook on to a regular Amtrak train at certain points and to be dropped off at certain points. Or the second way is if you have enough cars uh, together, you can do what's called a special train, uh, which is, in fact, a trip we have coming up next week. And uh, so that uh, you need a certain number of cars to support that. How, how many do you need to get your own special? Well, uh, you you probably need uh, uh, at least eight or nine cars to support the the cost of of doing a special train. Wow, wow, it's just amazing. So I, I've just got so many questions here for you. First of all, I, you know, and I know this is on everyone's mind as they're hearing you talk about this. So the, these cars are, you said, fifty to a hundred years old. Yes, they are. And and how much do they cost? Well, you can. Uh, uh, this is one of those questions that's difficult to answer because you could start with a rundown, beat up car and get it for ten thousand dollars, and or you could uh, get one at the far other end of the spectrum that's uh, completely finished and and uh, has the best of everything on it, and that could be 
uh, in the you know the mid to upper six figures. So wow. you, you don't have to go that high. There are many ways to do it, but you know th- that's the range of, of to get into the hobby. Yes. Right, right. So it it really sounds like I mean you know a lot of people are probably thinking as they're listening they're comparing this to a recreational vehicle when and this is an RV. It's a, a form of an RV, <laughs> quite a bit yeah. different than than what <laughs> yeah. most people think. But as such. You know, I mean, you can buy a beat up old RV for ten thousand dollars, and you can easily spend six, seven hundred thousand dollars on one. Well, not easily, but you can spend up to about a million five on a on a gorgeous motor coach, a forty five foot type type thing. So then the next question is expenses and and maintenance of a rail car. I, I would assume the maintenance probably isn't too bad, but I don't know. They're older. It doesn't have an engine, but but what does it cost to have have your car hooked up to a to a train? Well, uh, just to, to backtrack on your one comment there, uh, most cars have a uh, air conditioning system. They have a diesel generator. They're also able to use power from the train itself, and and so there are are some pretty good internal components. And being old, sometimes when something goes bad. Uh, you can spend a lot of time trying to re- find a replacement part. Anyhow, to it, it, uh, if you'd go on Amtrak, there there are a variety of charges they assess. And so, if you're doing a, uh, a solo trip, I'll call it your car, and you're going from Los Angeles to Chicago, for example, they they would have a mileage charge of let's say about two ten a mile, and then they have various parking and switching charges and so forth. So uh, say that again. That you, price? How much? Uh, about two dollars and and ten cents a mile. And, it's fairly and, expensive, then, huh? Yeah, and and so the general idea is people when they do trips, they try to have friends or people they know uh, to join in and and participate in the trip and help uh, uh, spread the cost around so that it's uh, not a prohibitive type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's a good point. So so what are the dimensions of a car? Are they all the same? Well, you could say as a general rule, uh, you could use something like 83 feet long by almost 10 feet wide. And and you have various types of cars that we have in our organization, which is the American Association of Private Railroad Car Owners. There's an association for everything. (laughs) Yeah, there is. You're not kidding. I I, got to ask you, Michael, do you know how many members this association has? (laughs) Well, we have, uh, uh, and not all of them own cars, but we have about 500 members. Uh, we have a good number of associate members who like to partake in trips and they uh, are interested in it, but they may not have their own car. And and but within our group, we've got about uh, 85 cars that are uh, mechanically uh, qualified to run on Amtrak uh, trains. And and so getting back to your question, there's various types of cars. Some are all sleepers. Some are a combination of a sleeper car and has lounge facilities. That, that seems like what you'd want, just like an RV, you know, you'd want yes, both. Yes, and, and, and like my car, for example, it has an open platform at the rear end. It has a lounge area. It has three bedrooms, a dining room, and uh, a kitchen, and then another little bedroom off the kitchen. Th- this is a true land yacht. I mean, it's 83 feet long, so it's it's about twice the length of a big RV. Wow! It's it's uh, yes, and and each car can handle varying amounts of people depending on how the car is laid out. So some some have more room in the lounge and the dining room and less for bedrooms and some have more bedrooms and less of the other so it's you see a wide variety of cars sure you do sure you do well it's got an open area at the back so are you able to be the caboose on the train i mean if you have this open area you wouldn't want another car attached right behind you i assume that is true and that so for this trip we have coming up the special next week uh, is going to be a special from Omaha, Nebraska to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and then back down to Kansas City. Since I had a big hand in putting the trip together, my car is going to be on the back of the uh, train. Mm-hmm. You so got you I, got the I, premier spot then, right? I, I got the, uh, yes, I do. I have the premier spot on this particular train. All right, and so just that cost again—about two dollars a mile, you said. 
a little over that. And and then of course you've if you're parking somewhere you'll have a parking charge and that varies a bit. And that's that's what I was going to ask you. Storage, you know, things like yeah, that. Yeah, and if you're switched around and so forth, there there are many the little charges that all add up. And, and uh, but they itemize those and and uh, pretty well. Uh, that's on the individual car move. If you do a special train, it's you generally they say the Amtrak will get with the appropriate freight railroad and they'll determine the costs and they'll say here's what you're going to pay per mile and that's why the more cars you have the merrier and and so that goes on that's computed on a different basis right right and uh, what an what an interesting and amazing thing gosh so you've got, you've got your own diesel generator you've got your own air conditioner i mean don't you get power from the train don't they supply power if you're on an Amtrak train, yes, you do. They, they have uh, what is called head-end power, which means that there's a generator in the, the locomotive that will supply power to the rest of the train. We had a trip last summer where we went from Spokane, Washington, up into Canada, and we were strictly with the freight railroad, Canadian Pacific, for the duration of our trip in Canada, they did not have a, a power in a normal freight locomotive, so we had to provide a what's called a power car that uh, provided the power for the cars on the train. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so I was going to ask you if you've taken if you've done any trips in Canada as well. And it's just such a bummer that the the railroad system is is monopolized by Amtrak in the U.S. How is Amtrak to work with? I mean, are they uh, bureaucratic and difficult, and are their prices reasonable or high? I wish there was a, a free enterprise system in, in rail travel right, here. Right, right. Well, uh, yeah, let me do a comment on that. Uh, I've seen actually uh, an improvement here in the last couple of years in our, our ability to deal with Amtrak on these trips. Since it is not really privately owned, per se, there is a, a bureaucratic element to it, and so sometimes it can get a little frustrating. But I think that uh, they've, they, I'll have to say, they've taken steps to improve the delivery of, of this service, and uh, I think it's headed in a, a pretty good direction, although it's not uh, beyond running into frustrations from time to time. For sure, it seems like it would be a neat idea to kind of rent before you buy, if you will, to, to kind of try this out and see if one likes it. Is there any market for renting a private rail car and taking a couple of trips and seeing if, hey, this is for me, I love it, and I want to get my own car, or, uh, oh, or, sure. or does that even exist? <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's. Uh, in fact, I can think of several people in our group that's uh, that have taken that approach. Uh, and, and have subsequently acquired cars. I think if anybody is interested, if they wanted to go to our website, which is www.aaprco.com, aprco.com, they will see this subject addressed. And, and taking a trip is absolutely the best way of, of determining if it's of any interest, if you want to devote the time and, and money to to get your own car, and and that's absolutely the best way to go. And then you get a picture of, am I better off getting a car that's going to have to be totally refurbished, or do I try to find someone who has already refurbished the car and is just wanting to, due to age or illness or lack of interest, wants to dispose of the car, which uh, obviously happens from time to time as well. Sure, sure. I, I mean, I mean, do you have any numbers or ideas as to how many rail cars are in private hands out there? I would think this market would be so small and so specialized. Well, I'd say, uh, in, in not talking about you know any short line railroads or things of that nature, but just in private ownership. There, there are the cars that are qualified to run on Amtrak. They meet all the safety and mechanical requirements and, and are certified to run. That's a relatively small number in the you know low hundreds. Uh, there are another group of cars that are able to run, just not on Amtrak and the speed of Amtrak. They may be able to run on a short line, uh, somewhere, or maybe they just like to have the car is is something to enjoy and so forth. Uh, well, there's got to be several hundred of uh, cars, or if not more, in that particular class. 
and we have some of those uh, people members of, of our group. So, and, and some of those people are get a car that isn't currently qualified, and then they, like I did, they spend a few years getting it up to speed where it kind of graduates to that certified class. And then there are some people that don't want to do that, but they have a deal with a short line somewhere that they'll do some trips on that and, and so forth. And they don't have to meet all of these high safety requirements. Yeah, I, you know, I would assume as you talk about certification and these requirements, I would assume that could become a real bureaucratic hassle and a something you'd have to argue about and deal with. Doesn't sound like too much fun. <laughs> well, you you go through an annual inspection and a safety inspection, and then every ten years they require that the trucks be removed from underneath the car, so everything there is inspected. And then every 40 years, which I, I don't think I'll have to worry about again, but every 40 years you do a, uh, a uh, complete rebuild of the trucks to make sure that there's no cracks, there's no damage, and, and so forth. So it's pretty strict, and there's a little bureaucracy there, but at the end of the day it's really good for us and good for everybody that we have to have these maintain these safety standards. Most yeah. certainly, you know, as long as, it's, long as it's reasonable and not ridiculous, right? And yeah, uh, as long yeah. as they're not they're not picking on you for some reason, which bureaucrats tend to pick on people. You know, <laughs> they they love yeah. to they love to show that they're powerful, and yeah, uh, you don't yeah. mess with them, right? Right. I hate to just keep asking about cost, but this is again so specialized. What do those annual inspections and and every decade inspections cost? Well, the annual inspect. I mean, if you get, for example, well, I just had that done, and and there were like four or five cars together. And so the inspection, you were able to spread the cost of getting that qualified inspector out among cars. And it was, for me, it was like, uh, I think it was under $1,000 or something to to uh, get that uh, inspection done. Uh, so it really wasn't, I mean, if, if it could be a bit more if you uh, were in an isolated spot and had the inspector come out. But it's not, that one isn't as bad. The other one, the uh, every 10-year job, eh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm just guesstimating, but I'd say I wouldn't be surprised if that was in the $7,500 range or something like that by the time you're all done. Yeah, yeah. So have you ever owned a motorhome by any chance? No, I haven't. Okay. No. Yeah, do, you, uh, do you have friends that do? I mean, you know, have you ever thought about the cost comparison on any of these? I'm just kind of wondering how they how they sort of stack up price of yeah, fuel I, and maintenance. I have no clue. I, I mean, I couldn't really an, uh, honestly answer that question. I don't know. Very don't interesting. Know Very yeah. interesting. This is just such an interesting thing. Well, I would assume that logistically this can get sort of complicated because you. how do you get to your home? I mean, do you take it to, the, for example, you, you are in Scottsdale. Arizona. Where where do you go to meet your, where is your car now? <laughs> well, my car <laughs> at this moment is probably uh, somewhere between uh, San Antonio and, and uh, Fort Worth on its way to Chicago. And so it will be in Chicago uh, tomorrow, I believe. And then I'm going to join up with it on uh, Monday in uh, Chicago. And then we go to Omaha on Tuesday. And then our special leaves Omaha on Wednesday. So, but you're right. It is a. You, it's not easy finding a good point to keep the car, and uh, uh, because there are not that many places available that are easily in close proximity to me for storage. I, we have kept it out here for a couple of years. Uh, I have kept it uh, at certain times in New Orleans and Kansas City, uh, and so forth. So. But the last two years, I've had it out here in Chandler, Arizona. In the world of private jets, they have something they call the deadhead, which is the return flight where the plane is empty. And that's the very costly thing because no one's making any use out of the plane at that point. And do you have a lot of deadheads with your rail car where you just say to them, for example, I think you said it was in Omaha at times, do you fly out to the car and then start your vacation? Or do you say, hey, bring the car over to Chandler, Arizona, and then we'll jump in? Well, you you would have, the, that's, you probably want to join it wherever you're storing it. It is it, a normal rule. Unless your the basic trip is going to be across country and you know you don't have time to ride it all the way and and just use up that much time, so there are deadhead runs. 
And I know that some of our members do make space available on these deadhead runs with, you know, they have a reduced level of service and, and uh, people can experience it, but it may not be the same level of service that they would get on a normal trip, you know, a, a scheduled trip. Well, so what do you mean level of service? I mean, are, are, are the Amtrak people coming into your car and waiting on you? No, no. You, you would provide that service yourself. In other words, if you uh, usually, maybe I, and I have seen situations, somebody has a friend that says, hey, I'm a chef, bring me along and, and uh, I'll do the cooking and, and serve the drinks and, and do a first class meals and, and so forth. And in and, and the true brown bag, you might say, hey, you know, we're going to have microwave dinners, and uh, but the cost is going to be very little to travel cross country on this deadhead move. So, so that's, uh, but people provide, Amtrak uh, does not provide any internal services to the cars. That each owner would determine what, what they want to do with respect to uh, the services inside their own cars. And, and when, you're, when you're on a train, I mean, you're not in control of where you stop. I mean, you just go on the train schedule unless it's your own train. What did you call that when you... When uh, you special. Buy, you, a special, you call yeah. special trains. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you're just making the stops that Amtrak makes, and right. you can't get off because then you'd leave your car. Yeah. You could only drop the cars at certain points, and uh, obviously it would mess up Amtrak's schedule if they let you drop off or bring the car on anywhere along the route. So it's it's usually major points that you can uh, do that. Like, uh, say, if you were going from Los Angeles to uh, Chicago, of course, you could go at either Chicago or Los Angeles, uh, midpoint, probably Albuquerque, you could get on and off. And, and then at Kansas City, you could get on or off. But those would be the only points where the car could be added or taken off the train. And so then if you have people on board who say, well, I want to get off somewhere along the route, they can get off, but the car is going to have to go on until a permitted point of addition or subtraction is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. It, it, it's, it's a little complicated, wouldn't you agree? Oh, this uh, it is, and especially when you do these special trains. I've had help from multiple people, and but I've spent countless hours on this trip coming up uh, from Omaha to Cheyenne, Kansas City, and there, there's just uh, all sorts of th issues you have to deal with, and both on the ground and and uh, getting the everybody at the Amtrak and the uh, the host freight railroad uh, satisfied, and and that they're on board and and so forth uh, so it's it's a lot of work yeah sure. yeah yeah it's it's got to be a labor of love well let's not just focus on all the the business side of it as we have and uh, you know all the difficulties and hassles with it because everything's got to you got to work for everything in life but maybe just talk about some of the trips you've taken and how enjoyable they are and the, the thing i love about the train is you don't have to drive you've got scenery and it's, it's neat it's a neat experience huh well, it really is, and you can uh, stretch out, and, and you're not confined to a little seat. And well, just to give, I've taken uh, trips uh, all through the Midwest, and uh, up in uh, uh, the trip last year, for example, we went from uh, Spokane. Well, we started in Portland, up the Columbia River, and up to Spokane. That's beautiful up and there. Yeah. That's beautiful. And then we went to the border at Kingsgate. And we met uh, Canadian Pacific Railroad there, right at the border, after we got through inspection. Uh, we were with Canadian Pacific, a great railroad, for about a week. And uh, they took us to uh, Nelson, uh, British Columbia Trail, Cranbrook. There's a fantastic railroad museum in Cranbrook, British Columbia. Uh, we spent a night right at Summit Lake, uh, Crow's Nest, uh, at the Continental Divide between in Canada and uh, I think it was the border between British Columbia and Alberta, and just to spend a night uh, about 50 feet from this lake with uh, complete serenity was just uh, something you'd ever forget. And then uh, how did you, how did you happen to spend the night there? Did the whole train just stop there, or yeah, we, this was a special. Okay, and so we had like 10 cars, and so as part of the routing of the train. Generally, on these specials, more times than not, you'll spend the night somewhere, and, and so you're not traveling all night. 
And so that was just the convenient spot, uh, albeit a beautiful one, to uh, spend the night. Very and, interesting. Uh, and then we came around the border again at uh, through Alberta down to the border crossing there at uh, Sawgrass. I think it's uh, the name, but we got came around through Glacier Park uh, in a blizzard in June and wound up for a couple of days in Whitefish, Montana, which is also a great spot to uh, to be. So that was just uh, the scenery and, and just the serenity. I mean, it's really, uh, uh, trips like that are really memorable. Yeah, they sure are. They sure are. Well, this has really been interesting. We have certainly peeled back the, the veil here on uh, something that is so specialized and, and just really, really, for lack of a better word, it's just very swank. <laughs> Well, I'm glad uh, I had the opportunity to do this because uh, it is good to get our little niche out there known to the uh, people that, uh, you know, you can always be surprised how many little different avocations and hobbies and so forth there are. And and, uh, and this is certainly one of them, but it's an enjoyable one. And we're always happy to have associate members who just want to sample our our group and, and partake in some trips. And then uh, maybe out of those, uh, there'll be a few people that actually buy cars. So to kind of preserve this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I got to ask you, are, what is your role in the association? Are you the founder or just a member? Or Well, I'm, I'm, uh, well I am was a member for quite a number of years. Uh, I've been on the board of directors for I don't know, six years now. Uh, I was president for a couple of years, uh, two years ago, uh, and now I'm uh, vice president legal for the organization. Fantastic. Well, good for you. Give out the website one more time, if you would. Yes, it's, uh, of course, www.aaprco.com. Fantastic. Well, Michael Margrave, thanks for joining us today. Jason, it's a pleasure. Always enjoy talking to you. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.